How many of you enjoyed our new teaching pastor last week? Yeah. Let, can we, this, this is 11, so I can, I can chill a little bit in this service, kick back. Can, can we get something out there and on the record? I've tried to put this out on the record, but a couple of people have brought it up this weekend. So I feel compelled to help everyone understand uh, something, okay? Uh, I'm okay, all right? And here's what I mean. Uh, I actually called Timmy this week, and I said, hey, I need to apologize for being a really bad friend. And he goes, he's in Orlando, and he goes, what, why? I said, well, I was teaching on the Leaders Cut a couple weeks ago about rooting for your spiritual siblings, and I used you as an example. And I, I said, you know, don't be the kind of person that needs your brothers and sisters to lose in order for you to feel like you win. When they win, you win. And I said, so I use you as an example. And I said, you're gonna come, you, you were coming to preach for me. And I said, you know, I know and hope Timmy gets 10,000 more views online than I do. And I go, I totally undersold you. This was Friday, it'd been out 48 hours. It was at like 18,000. And I go, I go, I'm sorry. I did not mean to undersell you. It's already the highest viewed sermon in Gateway Scottsdale and Pillar Church history. Hold on. Uh, the number, I'm not saying it for all the numbers. Please, please, okay? Because now it's at like 35,000, okay? But, but here's, here, I, there's a point to this, okay? Uh, several people have come up to me and they're like, uh, I love Tim Smith. I like yours too. <laughs> like, I'm actually hurt by it. And I go, okay, so let's just get this out there, okay? I am on the greatest team on planet Earth. And when someone on my team wins, my team wins, which means I win. Okay, so if, if my heart is for the kingdom of God to expand and grow stronger, just, just please don't shake my hand and be like, I like you too, Pastor Preston. <laughs> He's my twin. He's my best friend. I love it when he wins. But can, can we all just be such a legit family that we don't even come into this mug with insecurity anymore? Can we do that, please? Can we just love each other so much that we actually root for the success and well-being of the others? Okay, good. Good, good, good. Okay. So it's just, it's funny. The whole thing's funny to me. Like, like I didn't see it coming. Come on. Come on, I, 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 Tim and I had lunch with a, a young leader at another church, teaching pastor, uh, after the services were over, and he's picking our brain, and he's like, he's asking me. He's like, I, this, I have no frame of reference for this, because senior pastors don't let people who are better preachers preach in their pulpit. Okay, so number one, he was saying, and he's a friend of ours, he, he was saying, Preston, Tim's better than you. <laughs> I'm like, I know. But here's the way I describe it. I, I can shoot like Steph, but that doesn't mean I don't want KD on my team. Bro, I want to win titles. Do you like to lose? Like, I actually taught him this in Leaders Cup. What would you rather be? Would you rather be the best player on a bad team or one of the lesser players on the best team? Okay, this is the kingdom, homie. We've got some legendary all-stars on our team breathing on the earth today. And if this is war, I would like to fight alongside of them, not against them. Are we good? Okay. All right. So you can say Tim's message was amazing. I've been saying that for 15 years. <laughs> this weekend, we're continuing our series entitled Friend of God. And in this series, we're taking some time to answer some really important questions and to also help us understand that the God of the universe wants to be not just friends with us, best friends with us. It's mind blowing. Okay, and each week we're taking a look at one particular question and we're actually taking two weeks to answer each question. This weekend and next weekend we're answering this question and some theologians like A.W. Tozer say, who's one of my favorites, say this question is the most important question you'll ever be asked. Some of you might think, well, the, the most important question I'll ever be asked is, am I going to heaven or do I know Jesus? Important questions. A.W. Tozer said, this, this is the most important question. And here it is. What is God like? What is God like? So we're going to take two weeks answering this question. This week, I'm going to give you four answers to the question. Next week, hopefully six. 
But before we jump into the four answers, I, I want to give you point number one to kind of calibrate why this is so important. Point number one, lovers of God must know what God is actually like. When you study someone, but you're not close to them, you only know about them. But it does not mean you actually or intimately know them. Has anyone ever asked you, hey, do you know so-and-so? And your response is, well, I, I, I don't personally know them, but I know of them and I know about them because I follow them on Instagram. And, and so I feel like I know them because I, I've read five posts of theirs. When you're not close to someone, here's what will happen you'll create a picture of what you think they are like. This happens on social media all the time. But it also happens with God all of the time. If you don't take the time to pour through his word, not just listen to people talk about what God is like, if you don't personally take the time to pour through God's word and take him at his word when he tells you what he is like, Here's what will happen. You will end up painting a picture of him that is not true. And you will call it true because you think that's who he is. But in fact, sometimes it can be the exact opposite of who he tells us he is. If I asked you that question, what is God like? How would you answer it? Would it be opinion or would it be scriptural? How many of you played with Legos when you were younger? Anybody play with Legos? Okay. When I was growing up, I played with Legos. And if you ever played with Legos, you kind of know how you started off if you were young. I was probably four or five. I'm sure the first time I played with Legos, I loved them. The first package or box of Legos you get is usually how big? It's like this big, right? It's, it's this, and you don't know it. Like you think you're an amazing builder because you built something out of scrap heap, right? And there's only like 20 pieces in the box. But at five years old, you think you are a legit worldwide quality builder. Well, when I was young and I was playing with Legos, I learned there's a cheat code. Because inside the box of every Legos, there is an instruction manual, right? With pictures of each piece and how to assemble so that it looks like the picture on the outside of the box. But I learned there was a cheat code. A way around the instruction manual. Just look at the picture. I'm a visual learner. And so I just look at the picture and I can put the pieces together, right? Well, that works when there's only 20 pieces. But once you move on to the Star Wars destroyer that's three and a half feet long with thousands of pieces, it's literally impossible to build by just looking at the picture. Here's what concerns me about answering this question what God is like. Too many of us are getting answers off our social media feed and off the opinions of others rather than pouring through God's word on our own. And so we end up going off of their painting or perspective or perception of who God is rather than who God says he actually is. And when you try and build the Christian life, just like when you build with Legos, when you open up the instruction manual, what was the first thing you would see on the first page? The words, step one. Now let's be real. How many of us, when we're building something, do we like to bypass the instruction manual altogether? Let's just be honest. Okay? And what typically happens when you roll like that? You get to the end and you have extra pieces left. And what do you do if you're like me when you get to the end of building something and you have extra pieces left? You convince yourself of one of two things. First, you convince yourself they were extra pieces. <laughs> or you convince yourself they were unnecessary pieces. <laughs> That's all right, we didn't need them anyways. And yet that playground is like rocking and making creaking noises that it's not supposed to make. Yeah, because you have eight extra bolts left over. <laughs> but yet we try and build really important things all the time by bypassing the instruction manual. God's word is God's instruction manual for the life of following Jesus. What is step one? When you play with the Legos, first page, step one, first piece. What is step one of building out the life of a Christ follower? Look no further than the first four words of God's word. In the beginning 
God. Studying God is the step, the first step in being a follower of Jesus. But many of us as believers want to jump to the good parts, like he's not the best part. And so what do we do? We want to study the gifts first. When step one is not to study the gifts, it's to study the capital G giver. Some of us think the best part is the power. So we want to study the power when step one is not to study the power, it's to study the one who has all power. Some of us are so excited, we think step one is worship. When step one is not to worship, it is to study the one who alone deserves all worship. He is step one. When I was getting ready to propose to my wife, I thought the Lord issued me a challenge. He goes, Preston, here's, you love challenges, here's a challenge for you. By the time you die many years from now, I want you to know more about this little girl than any human on the earth, including her parents. I've told you stories about me when I was 21 years old. I was an arrogant mo. So God issues me a challenge. I'm like, bro, I will knock that challenge out in less than five years. You, you, oh, okay. I, I, I did not understand what he was doing with me. I thought he was literally like issuing me a challenge, wanting me to be all riled up and be like, I got this. Okay. I miss what he was trying to teach me. He was teaching me, Preston, lovers are learners. You're going to say every day of her life that you love her. One of the best ways to show her is by learning her. Because lovers are learners. I also didn't understand. He was trying to teach me this, he, this is what he wanted from me in our relationship. Preston, I want you to devote your entire life to learning about me. Notice he doesn't say, Pastor, Pastor, I want you to devote your whole life to learning about me. This is not a vocational thing. It's a relational thing. I'm his child. Lovers are learners, son. I want you to devote your life to learning about me. Don't take their word for it. Take my word for it. We must, as lovers of God, know what God is actually like. Lovers are learners. Now, if you have a Bible, open up to 1 Chronicles 28. In this moment, and I'll give you some context, King David is about to give Solomon, who's about to become king, in my opinion, the best advice any father ever gave one of his children in Scripture. A little context. King David, at the time these words are spoken, it appears was the wealthiest man on the planet because he's about to give the single biggest offering in the history of humanity. Present-day dollars over a quarter of a trillion dollars. He gives to the Lord to build the temple. So he's the wealthiest man on the planet at the time. He could have told his son, with my last words, you want to be the wealthiest man on the earth? Here's what you do. But that's not what he tells his son. At the time these words are spoken, King David is the best king Israel will ever have not named Jesus. He could have told his son, you want to be the best king who ever lived? This is what you do. But he doesn't speak those words to his son. At the time these words are spoken, King David is known as one of the greatest warriors Israel will ever know and the best warrior king Israel will ever have. If he wanted to tell his son, if you want to be the best warrior our nation ever has, this is what you do. But those are not the words he speaks to his son. What words does he speak? I'll show you. Remember the backdrop. It's as though he's giving his dying words to his son. And in verse 9 of 1 Chronicles 28, David says, Solomon, my son, learn to know the God of your ancestors intimately. Worship and serve him with your whole heart and a willing mind. Out of all the things David could have said to Solomon, who would go on to become the wisest man who ever lived, these are the words he leaves with his son. David is saying, if you want to be like me, 
This is the key to being me. Learn to know the God of your ancestors, not intellectually. And that's good for those of us who think that learners of God can only be the smart ones. He says, get to know the God of your ancestors intimately. Oppressing the ones who can know God can only be the theologians. Well, the word theology means the study of God. I just told you what I believe God says is a learner, a studier, a lover. If you love God, you are automatically qualified to be a learner about God. I don't care what you got on the SAT. I guarantee you, you beat me. <laughs> but I promise something I've committed to never losing to you in, learning more and more about him. You might know more about him than me today. I'll catch you tomorrow. And you may know more tomorrow. I'll catch you in a week. When I get to heaven, I want to be the nerdiest one among us, chasing the one I love, waiting for him to mumble something I've never heard him say before. It's not because I'm smart. It's just because I'm obsessed. Lovers are learners. Now, what is God like? So we establish how important it is to know. What is God like? Point number two, this is the first answer, first of four answers this weekend. So the question, what is God like? God is transcendent. If you're in 1 Chronicles 28, go a chapter further to chapter 29. David's now giving the single largest offering in the history of humanity. And if you're wondering why he does it, just read it. He tells you exactly why he does it. And part of what he says in that speech is, yours, O Lord, is the greatness. The implication here is all greatness. All greatness is yours, O God. All power is yours. All glory is yours. All victory is yours. All majesty is yours. Everything in the heavens and on earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. The word transcendent means beyond. This is one of the verses tied to the attribute of transcendence. He is so big that he is indescribably beyond all that is or ever will be. Now, one of the things that Christians can say from time to time are these words. I feel like God is so close to me right now. This can be and is true, but we must keep this in proper perspective. When we don't have the proper perspective of God, when he feels close, the more close we think God is to us, the easier it is to believe the lie that he is like us. Yet in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 23, God says, am I not a God near at hand and not a God who is also far off? He says, here's how big I am. I am simultaneously right next to you and so far beyond that I am the furthest possible distance away from you and everything in between all at once. He's beyond. He transcends all things. Now, we're going to do something a little bit fun to illustrate this. Isaiah chapter 40, if you're feeling beaten down a little bit, you just feel like God has you in a fight, you're losing, you feel alone, go read Isaiah 40 this week. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible, and the reason it's one of my favorites is because I think it's one of the best chapters in Scripture where God shows his divine sense of, of confidence and sarcasm simultaneously. And one of the things he says in verse 12 of Isaiah 40, God says, who else has held the oceans in his hand? Okay, we're going to illustrate this. I want everybody to take one of your two hands. If you have two, if you, you don't have two hands, and I'm not making a joke, you can just look at the hand of the person next to you. Okay? Look at your hand. I want you to draw a circle in your palm. God asks the question in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12. He says, who else has held the oceans in the palm of his hand? Okay, don't look at me. Look at the palm of your hand. Draw the biggest circle without going into your fingers and just stare 
at the, the size of that circle while I give you this factoid. Did you know 71% of the Earth's surface is water? You know how much water that is? 912,000, don't look at me, look at the palm of your hand, 912,000 cubic miles of water. How much water can you fit in the palm of your hand? A couple drops, right? God says, he goes on record and he says, you want to know how big I am? How much I transcend? Who else has held all of the drops of water on the earth in the palm of their hand? 912,000 cubic miles. Okay, the second half of verse 12. God says, and who else has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Okay, let's keep going. I want you to take your thumb and your pointer finger and stretch it out as far as you can, and I want you, while I give you these factoids, to stare at the distance between those two fingers. Okay? This is not a drill. I'm being literal. Look at the distance between your two fingers as I give you these factoids. How many of us would say the earth is huge? Is the earth huge? Okay. Wouldn't it be impressive if God said, who else measures the earth with two of his fingers? That would be impressive, but that's not what he says. Did you know? The sun can hold within itself 1.3 million Earths. Wouldn't it be pre- impressive if God said, who else measures the sun which could contain 1.3 million Earths? But he doesn't say that. The sun is just one of the stars in our galaxy. Well, Preston, how many stars do scientists believe are in our galaxy alone? Glad you asked. 400 billion. It would be impressive if God said, who else can measure a galaxy with 400 billion stars that could contain 1.3 million Earths each? That would be impressive, but that's not what he said. He said, who else can measure the heavens, all of it, with just two of his fingers? You know how many galaxies scientists say now, based on our newest technology with new telescopes, how many galaxies there are, discoverable galaxies there are in our universe alone? Over two trillion galaxies. With old technology, they used to say 150 billion, and I was impressed with that. Now it's a new number, over two trillion. The next time you email me and say, my problems are huge, I'm going to send you a picture of me going like this. (laughs) Because the God of the universe goes on record and says, Here's how big and beyond I am. I alone am the one who measures over two trillion galaxies with just two of my fingers. I am so tired of us acting like the enemy is the big one. The reason he tries to scare you is because he is so deathly afraid of the one who stands with me, who is measuring two trillion universes like this. Listen, some of us have like this thought that the enemy is the one who's so big we just hope to beat him. Our God is so big, his enemy knows he has no chance of beating him. What is God like? (laughs) He's beyond everything that ever will be. The transcendence of God helps keep us from bringing down, bringing God down to our level. God is close to you, but that does not mean he is anything like you. 
God is saying in Jeremiah 23 that he wants you to understand he's so big that he is simultaneously near and far. He says this, I believe, because we get too comfortable with his closeness and we don't have nearly enough understanding of his transcendence. God says, I'm close and I'm far. Now, why is this so romantic? I'll give you my opinion. What do you do when something you want seems far from your reach? If you want it bad enough, you reach for it. I believe God is saying, I don't want you to ever feel so close to me that you stop reaching for me. Having said that, I never want you to feel so far from me that I ever feel out of reach from you. (laughs) I am transcendent, Preston. Here's the second answer to the question, point number three, what is God like? Yes, God is transcendent, but God is also imminent. Another way to say imminence is nearness. God is near. He's not just everywhere, he's everywhere you are. Isaiah 7.10 speaks about one of the names to be given to Jesus. It says the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. He's not just the God who is everywhere. He is the God who is with me. Too many people who don't know Jesus think that Jesus came to punish us when in fact he was given the name that meant the God who came to be with us not the God who came to spank us. And as if God needed to prove how near he wanted to be to us after Jesus, he sent the Holy Spirit to live inside of us. Talk about nearness. Now, some of us might be in a difficult situation. You might feel you're in a little bit of trouble. One of the things I've learned about God's enemy in times of trouble is he likes to try and convince us that God is nowhere near us. I wanna show you one verse. If you feel like you're up under it, you're in a fight and you're all by yourself, let me read you one verse. Psalm 46, verse one. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Why is God a very present help in trouble? (laughs) The answer is simple. He loves you too much to leave you. When you encounter trouble, you don't need to pick up the bat phone and hope God answers. He's already there because he never left. In Psalm 46, verse 1, I believe God is saying, Preston, take my nearness out for a spin. One of my favorite reasons for being near to you is when you feel like you're in trouble. I'm always present and accounted for. I am with you no matter what you're going through. Fourth thing. I want to get to the closing illustration so bad. I'm just going to move to point number four. Two more points. What is God like? Third answer. God is incomprehensible. I could read you a lot of verses, but I'll read you one. Psalm 145, verse 3. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Incomprehensibility means impossible to completely comprehend. The incomprehensibility of God does not mean we cannot know God. It means we cannot know God exhaustively. Think about why this is so amazing. Think about how it would change your relationship with God if God were able to be completely comprehended. Ever seen a Hallmark movie before? (laughs) The most predictable thing on planet Earth. When I was growing up, one of my, my teachers used to say, only two things that are certain, death and taxes and Hallmark movies. I've watched them all. And I've learned there are only four scenarios for a Hallmark movie. A small town, a big city, a farm, or a vineyard. 
Apparently, nothing else in all the world happens outside of those four places. And in every Hallmark movie, she always gets the guy, he always gets the girl. They're the most predictable thing on the planet. My wife loves, I've, I've, I've shared this. She's out of town, so I can kind of be really, really transparent with you about this. She's not watching. She loves to watch these movies, and she loves when I watch these movies with her. Do not tell her this. I turn my brain off when we watch these movies. I love these movies because the one I love loves these movies, but I can turn my brain off because I know how it's going to end used to bother me in the beginning of our relationship when we watched these movies. I'm like, I already know how it ends. Why would I watch this? She said, because I want to watch it. Men, you know this. As you get older, you learn. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to watch this movie with you. (laughs) Now, some of the men are judging me right now, going, what kind of moron enjoys Hallmark movies? Because I love them now. Here's my answer to that question. Whenever a movie ends with intimacy between me and my wife, in my book, it's a good movie. Facts.com. <laughs> Who am I to judge? I turn my brain off, but I don't turn my heart off. <laughs> hey. For some reason, at the end of every Hallmark movie, this girl loves me more than she did before the movie started. <laughs> but here I am, sitting here with my brain shut off. Why? Because I know how it ends. If God could be completely comprehended, this is what you would do with him. I already know how this conversation ends because I already know everything there is to be known about you. It's actually romantic that is, he is completely incomprehensible. I'll say it like this. God loves you so much and he so loves you when you seek after him to learn more about him that he is incomprehensible. And here's how I think God would say it. One of my favorite things to say to you are these words. I want to tell you something about me I never told you before. And I love it so much that it is literally impossible for me to run out of new things to tell you about me. Let me make sure you know what this means. That there is so much incredible stuff to know about God that we, will ne- that we will spend eternity learning new things about him and never run out of new things to learn about him. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, God helps us understand this. He says, For my thoughts are not like your thoughts, nor are my ways like your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Preston, I'm not like you. You're limited, I'm not. And I am extending an eternal invitation to study me. I will give you all of me that you want. You mean you're giving me a blank check to learn about you? You're my son. Why wouldn't I? And this leads us to point number five, the fourth fourth answer to the question, what is God like? Yes, God is incomprehensible, but God is also knowable. So we established that we cannot know God exhaustively. So some might say, well, then why even try? I'll give you one great reason why you should try. No matter who you are, how good you are, or how bad you think you are, God wants to be known by you. He wants to spend eternity being studied by you. Help me understand why you have such a low view of you. When the God of the universe right now might be sitting on the throne talking out loud about you saying, Oh, I've been waiting for this day since before the beginning of time. She's going to learn something about me she's never known before. And it's going to cause her to draw nearer to me than ever before. I've been waiting for this day. Help me understand why your view of you is so low when God's conversation about you is so consistent. The God of the universe desires to be known by you. 
Yes, he is incomprehensible, but that does not mean he is not knowable. And I want to show you what Scripture says is one of the best ways to know God, by watching Jesus. Colossians 1.15 says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Do you know what this means? It means that God didn't just send Jesus to save you. It means the Father sent the Son to show you what the Father is like. He so badly wants to be known by you, and he's not the author of confusion. He does not desire you to be confused about what he is actually like. And so one of the reasons he sent his son was so that you could know exactly what he's like. Preston, you want to know what I'm like? Watch the son. Follow the son around, and you'll understand the father better. I, son, I don't want you to be confused about what I'm like. I don't want you to go on hearsay. One of the biggest reasons I sent my son was to give you a visible image of what I am like, which you cannot yet see. If you want to know what God is like, watch Jesus. Now, some of you might be saying, but what about those who refuse to look at Jesus? Those whose hearts are hardened to anything having to do with Jesus? Well, there's another way. Anyone, no matter what they believe about Jesus, can see and know even just a little about God through nature. Timmy talked about this last week. Someone who doesn't know God still sees parts of God when they see parts of nature. Psalm 19, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4 say this. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or a word. Their voice is never heard, yet their message has gone throughout the whole earth and their words to all the world. Have you ever sat on the edge of the ocean at night listening to the waves roll in beneath the stars? You can't even see all 400 billion of them. Incidentally, Isaiah 40, God goes on a record and says, press on every one of those stars. I put them in their exact place because that's exactly where I wanted them. Do you realize that scripture says, even when your friends who do not yet know God won't listen to you talk about God or the goodness of God, that they cannot get away from God. Someone who does not yet know God, no matter what they believe about God, encounters God every time they encounter something the Creator created. Sitting on the edge of the ocean, watching the sun rise in the morning, watching the stars fill the sky, listening to a newborn giggle. These are just a few examples of encountering a small piece of a really big God. He so badly wants to be known that he displays his awesomeness to those who cannot even yet hear his voice. Only a God who deeply and badly wants to be known does stuff like that. Now, how does this affect your personal relationship with God? Well, one line, and I hope you catch this. The God of the universe wants to be known by you. Let me close with this. Let's say at the end of this service, I have everyone stand, I'm about to dismiss you, and just before I dismiss you, the most famous person you can imagine, imagine them right now, the most famous person that you can imagine walks through those doors. And everyone starts looking in their direction and starts freaking out. This is the most famous person you can imagine. What? Does this person go to church here? I knew I liked this church for a reason. Wrong reason to like this church, by the way. most famous person you can imagine walks through the doors. 
and you notice it's them, the person you've wanted to meet for decades. And you're trying to play it cool, but your heart's racing a little bit. And you think, this is my chance. I'm going to meet the most famous person I could imagine. And just as the reality of the moment is setting in on you, the most famous person you can imagine starts walking towards you. <laughs> you thought your heart was racing before. They walk right to your seat. You don't even give them a chance to talk. You think, this is my moment. I'm taking my shot. Can I please take a picture with you for my Instagram page? The most famous person you can imagine slaps your phone out of your hand. Says, there'll be time for that later. I heard you were here and I wanted to meet you. I've made my way through this illustration two times and didn't cry now. Because you're going to figure out where I'm going if you haven't already. I heard you were here. I've, I've got a couple hours before I need to head out for a meeting on the West Coast. Want to go down the street and grab some coffee? What? Yeah, yeah. Let's go hang out for a couple of hours. And here are the ground rules. You can ask me any question about anything and I will give you the answer. I will hide nothing from you. You race to coffee. Six hours go by. And you're just, you feel like you're in heaven on earth. I just got to spend six hours with the most famous person I could imagine. He or she stands up, says, well, we've got to wrap up our time. I've got to catch a flight and you blurt out thank you so much for letting me just spend the last couple hours with you this is the most amazing day of my life I'll never forget this and the most famous person you can imagine says well it doesn't have to end if you don't want it to my plane is four minutes from here and it's ready to go if you'd like to text your family they can fly with us so your family's been waiting in the parking lot for six hours. <laughs> and you call them and you say, the most famous person I can imagine has just offered us a chartered flight with them to an important meeting on the West Coast. Should we go? The whole family. Let's go. They meet you right over here at the jet. You walk them up the steps. And it's the biggest chartered plane you've ever seen. And in the middle of the plane is the biggest smorgasbord you've ever laid your eyes on. Filled with all of your favorite things. And you look, feeling like you're a little closer than the rest of your family to the most famous person you can imagine because you just spent the last six hours together. You say, how did you know these were our favorite things? And the most famous person you can imagine says, well, I have my team stalk your social media pages. And I had them make a list of all of your favorite foods. And I had my team fly all over the world to make sure they were on this plate, on this table for our flight. Everybody sits down there enjoying their favorite food. The flight is quick. You land at John Wayne. You blurt out because you think, this is so great. Thank you for letting us ride in the plane. Thinking he's going to say, she's going to say, now you're just going to go back home. And he says, it doesn't have to end if you don't want it to. Come to my meeting with me. I can't sit in that meeting. You told me you're meeting with some of the biggest power players in the world. Yeah, you're my plus one. Come with me. So you go and sit through this really powerful, important meeting, pinching yourself, going, I can't believe I'm hearing this conversation and learning what I'm getting to learn. And at the end of the meeting, the most famous and powerful person you can imagine comes over to you and you, thinking it's over, blurt out, thank you so much for letting me sit in this meeting. Thank you so much for this day. I'll never forget this day. 
And he says, it doesn't have to be over if you don't want it to be. And you say, well, it's nighttime. What are we going to do? And the most famous person you can imagine says, well, I kind of have a really large house. And one of your children blurts out, how large? <laughs> and the most famous person you can imagine says, about 260,000 square feet. And I had my team set aside an entire wing for you and your family. I don't care about really famous people because David got it and he said, all fame is yours. The most famous person on the earth pales in comparison to you, oh God. The most famous one who will ever be chases you everywhere you go, gives you carte blanche access to him no matter when. You're going to have to help me understand why you don't take him up on that unprecedented offer every day of your life. If the most famous person you can imagine did it, I think you'd take them up on it. Well, he immeasurably trumps them. I think it's about time. You change whatever must be changed. So that in the morning, when the most famous one, whoever will be, starts your day saying, hey, there's a lot of other things I could do today, but I've decided the one thing I want to do is spend the day with you. Get on the plane. Enjoy the meal. Ask the questions. Learn in the meetings. But whatever you do, don't say no. He is trying to show you what he is like every time he invites you to spend a moment with him. What is God like? This is what God is like. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 13 and 14. God goes on record and he says, if you look for me wholeheartedly, if you'll come after me, you will find me. Verse 14, some of the greatest words I believe the God of the universe has ever set on record. He says, I will be found by you. I'm not hiding from you, but you have to come after me. When I invite you to spend the day with me, you've got to say yes to me. I don't want to pretend to be his friend. I want to be his best friend. And the cry of my heart as the pastor of this church in the season is this, that every day of your life, if even just by an inch you draw nearer to God than the day before, it's when we draw near to him that he shows us more of himself and teaches us more about him. Answer the call. Don't decline the invitation any longer. Get on that plane. Fall asleep in the seat next to him. Ride up the chairlift in the middle of a 12-inch that day blizzard like I did this week all by myself and say, I feel like you've been kissing me on the forehead all morning. And he says, well, because I have. I've been kissing you on the forehead since before you awakened. Don't decline his invitation. Holy Spirit, we need your help. Would you divinely enable us to be pursuers of God, chasers of the Father's heart? 
I don't want to know about him. I want what I learn about him to draw me nearer to him. God, may we as your children be known for our obsession for you. You are the God who longs to be known by us. May we chase him like never before. In Jesus' name, amen.